Wei, it is lovely to have you on camera. Thank you so, so, so much for joining me today. Um, this is really exciting. Like, you know, I'm having this watch auction that's called the Beauty and Everything Sale. And in the watch auction, there are a bunch of pieces that were done in collaboration with you. And I thought it would be super fun to hear your thoughts on these pieces, you know, and to just kind of get like the inside scoop. Maybe we go chronologically. So there's three pieces, right? So there's the um, Bulgari Octo Finissimo Chrono nuclear option. There it is. Very nice. And then there's the Baltic Bicompax Chrono with the salmon dial. Also awesome. I love it. And then finally, the Chopard. Oh, man, you're a superstar. You have all of these ready, ready and waiting. I love it. Yeah, I did. So, Mark, first of all, uh, great to see you. And, you know, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this initiative. Um, maybe the first thing I, I, I would love to ask you is, you know, why um, are you selling, you know, the majority of your watch collecting? Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, like, it's, so tell, tell me a little bit about that, if you don't mind my asking. Absolutely. 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 Um, I am selling everything because I wanted to try and buy a new shop in New York. And you know what? New York real estate market is actually, uh, I might have a shot. I might have a chance, you know, but before I go chasing after properties, I kind of wanted to raise some cash for it. And uh, I've been collecting watches for about 16 years now. I've amassed a stupid amount of watches. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe this is like, this is a good reason for me to let go of these things. Because over the years, I was already starting to build to this point where I was like, Oh man, like this is a lot of stuff. Like it, it becomes a little bit of a, it, it, you feel you feel guilty to be frank. I'm a little bit like, oh man, should I have this many things? And you know, I, I love the idea that I'm trading up, right? Like I'm trading out of all these things in my safe to like something that can benefit many more people. I mean, this is obviously not an act of charity, but it's just cool to have like a new location that my team can enjoy, that my customers can enjoy, that people can come and find us in. Like, I love that. You know, I think that's super great. I think that's really admirable, you know, um, and I, I agree with you also that it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I look, looking at the collection and looking at the watches that you have to offer, obviously you've got some stuff that people would consider to be, you know, priceless or grails. Um, but it's also interesting from the perspective of kind of changing, you know, your focus in life as well. The, you know, you've created something amazing with the, with the armory and the idea to, that you could give it a permanent location in, in New York city and you know, like kind of the armory home in, uh, in, in America, that's remarkable, you know? Oh, thank you, man. It's very kind of you to say so. So uh, I guess we should talk about these watches. Um, you had mentioned the, I guess the first one in chronological order was the Bulgari uh, Opta Finissimo chronograph GMT nuclear option, which is which is this watch right here. Um, Wait, before we get into the specifics of this watch, actually, because I think of you as like a pioneer in this collaboration space. Oh, Like what brought you to doing just in general collaborations in the first place? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I guess now they've become a business, but when I first got into them, they actually weren't a business because like the whole idea that a brand would allow you to sell their watches, least of all online was, you know, I mean, it was just absurdist. It just goes to show you how like things rapidly, things have changed over the last decade or so. So mm -hmm. the, you know, for me, it's always um, it's related to sentiment and related to what I would like to wear. Oftentimes it was models that were discontinued or potentially even like models that a brand, um, they could make, but they hadn't yet, maybe because it was a little bit more daring or adventurous or just mm -hmm. crazy, right? Um, as in the case of the nuclear option. So I remember it all started um, in uh, 2013. Um, I was always in love with the world of offshore. I had the original watch from 1993. Um, and then like a lot of watch collectors who are in their sort of uh, that phase of their life when they're young, you know, I bought it and then I sold it to buy something else, right? And then I'd always regretted it. And at some point I, you know, I was searching for another one of these watches and I couldn't find the right one, you know? And then I remember talking to Olivera Bottinelli, whose uh, family is one of the shareholders of a market PA who's based here in Singapore um, and about how much I love that watch. Um, and I said, you know, it's, it's 2013 will be a pretty significant anniversary anniversary for that model be the 20th anniversary of that watch do you think we could do like a limit production of that watch um, in the original configuration but my idea was the original roll of offshore um, had a closed case back because it was meant to be um, anti-magnetic and it was also using the um, uh, hallowed uh, you know I believe they call it um, the caliber 2121 which was which they still use right a lot they use it still as the base for like a perpetual calendar um, 
uh, Royal Oak, uh, for example, it's the ultra thin automatic movement um, that allowed them to make the world's thinnest automatic perpetual calendar at one point. Um, and it's a Jaeger design movement, but you know they now had an in-house movement, which I said, well, wouldn't it be really cool if you could use that as the base instead? It would be like a nice um, a milestone, say 20 years later, we're able to do this watch with our own caliber. So uh, Olivero said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And so he made, um, I believe it was 20 pieces to celebrate the 20th anniversary. Um, wow. And then all 20 collectors came to Singapore, um, picked up their watch during the uh, the GP, the, the F1 race, right? Um, and they all got to join AP for the evening um, of the race itself and then had like a big party afterwards. So that was, uh, it was pretty cool. And then uh, from there, it's funny because I actually uh, have wanted a watch that you have for sale in, in your auction, right? Which is the Portuguese Jubilee, the 5441, right? Which I think is an incredible watch. Um, it's really the watch that kickstarted back the, the whole Portuguese, uh, you know, um, family. But that watch is really particular because it's got this really stunning pocket watch movement, a full bridge pocket watch movement that I just absolutely adore. So I had, so I bought that watch. Um, and wrote in rose gold i had owned it and then really regretted selling it later right oh yeah because the, the first one was 1993 or something like that i think right exactly um yeah. and i couldn't you know I, I couldn't uh i couldn't find another one on the market that i that was in the condition that i really liked as well and you know i remember i was at sihh and i and, and i was speaking to george Kern and said you know i love this watch um, would it be possible to do a limited edition of this watch? And George uh, very kindly said, you know what, Wayne, let me look into it. So incredibly, he said, well, we can't make an all new case for this watch because it would be an absolute disaster from a, um, a cost perspective. But we do have 10 new old stock cases in, in, in at the manufacturer. So we'll use this as the base of the watch. And after that, he very, very kindly made 10 of these watches for, for us, you know, as a re revolution edition. In fact, there's even a star in the center of the barrel cover of that watch as well. Okay. Man, that's so cool. That's right. so cool. And so those were the two, two first limited editions. Um, and I think, so it was only like later, you know, after the rise of kind of e-commerce and so on like that, after, um, uh, uh, collaborations, you know, actually, I, I think I, I'm still, I think Ben from Odinki had done a couple of them and I, and I, and I was still doing them and I was like, you know, what, I want, I want, it would be cool to sell them as well. Right. And I remember the first one that we were able to actually sell ourselves was our collaboration with Ty Coyer, which was based on a Carrera, um, a skipper, uh, but with a all blue colorway called the, the blue, blue dreamer, which is still, a pretty popular watch today. Like it's funny. Like you hashtag uh, search the hashtag Blue Dreamer, you'll see like you know like a couple thousand posts of that watch pop up. You know? So incidentally, the watch you're wearing on your wrist. So I mean, I I love this thing, and actually I have another resins. I have the 10th anniversary resins that's going into the sale, so that I can keep this one because I think this one is just like one of the most brilliant things ever. It was such a stroke of genius on a, on the part of all of you guys involved in the project. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I mean, that that watch is an interesting one, too, because it represents the very first watch that um, I created for my new company called Grail Watch, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the ambition behind Grail Watch was to elevate limited editions to, like, you know, the, the next level, you know, to, to be a little bit more ambitious. So, like, for there's different chapters in Grail, Grail Watch, uh, chapter one was dream collaborations. Um, and so I thought, well, be, you know, I think it would be great to do something with Alan Silverstein, um, but I wonder who he would want to collaborate with. And when I asked him, he said, well, I, I love restaurants because Benoit, who's the founder of restaurants, also comes from kind of outside of the watch industry as well. Mm. Alan, an architect, Benoit is an industrial designer. Um, and both of them have kind of made their own mark in, in this world that we love. And so um, after a conversation you know, between the two of them, they agreed to work together. But what I was re re really surprised about was that rather than doing kind of a more straightforward Alan Silverstein design, he decided to take on this concept of moment memento mori, you know, uh, time is passing. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's usually depicted in like still life paintings as like a skull, you know, a flower wilting and then an hourglass, mm -hmm. right? I remind people that like, life is... is uh, is, is transient, you know? Um, and then he did kind of a cute or kawaii version of those that theme on, on the watch yeah. we were. Thanks, man. And people people seem to have responded to it, you know? Like, uh, they seem to dig it. Well, it's a wonderful piece of work. Um, let's jump forward now, or back, to the Bulgari. Right. Because it's not your first Bulgari either. 
Like you've been, uh, you've been working on quite a few things. That was our third Bulgari, actually. Um, so I remember, so uh, let's jump back to 2014 when they unveiled Octo Finissimo at the, the Basel Fair, the, uh, which, well, the now defunct Basel Fair. Um, and, you know, this is, I remember walking into the Bulgari booth and uh, Jean-Christophe Babin like handed me this watch. This gives us your simple sort of like, uh, you know, like, like the initial version of the Octo Finissimo. Actually, actually it was, it was uh, the Tourbillon version of it, which was one of the very first um, Octo Finissimos. And I was like, this is just the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like the idea of this, you know, sculpted and faceted watch, which had this extraordinary kind of like dynamic tension between something that had massive, you know, like presence on your wrist. Then when you turned it sideways, it seemed to almost kind of disappear, right? Like that was just crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was just absolutely obsessed by that watch. I think um, in 2016, they, they did the, uh, the the minute repeater version of that watch. And I love that watch. And I loved in particular how it was just all, like it was a minute repeater, but it was all sandblasted titanium. It had these cutouts in the dial, you know, um, instead of where, where the indexes where, you know, sound could, could come, uh, emerge. And um, I was like, you know, it would be amazing to do a version of that watch, but like, you know, like a non-complicated, like a time only uh, version of that. And they, they, very very kindly agreed to uh, to do that and that was um that was actually oh, actually you're right this is our very that was our actual very first um uh, limited edition that we were able to sell and this was even before the era of like selling things online so we basically wow. created watch. we wrote an article about it in print and then people would just reach out to us and we do it the old-fashioned way right? <laughs> like you, later on um uh, Fabrizio Bonamasso and Joe Christophe Band designed an amazing chronograph so their very first uh, to all titanium GMT uh, chronograph, which is um, uh, ultra thin automatic chronograph with a peripheral mass to it. And it was just insane. Like, I just love that watch. Mm. Um, and then, you know, that evening, I believe it was 2018, I was uh, having um, uh, dinner with Fabrizio and I was like, wouldn't it be cool if you did like a, like a tool version of this watch, right? Like, you know, where, and he said, yes, that's true. So what, what you would then do is you need to have a tachymeter on the bezel um, and then it should be luminous, right? But then he went off and, and, and this is before he even agreed to do the addition. He said, I've done some studies on it and it's impossible to make the indexes luminous because the indexes are so thin right like the i've been to the factory and like the indexes on the applied indexes are like galvanically grown and then like mm -hmm. kind of glued to the dial like they're like stickers so you put them onto the dial and it's crazy how thin they actually are right mm. so he said well what we could do however is make the entire dial luminous and that's when he came up with the concept for an all luminous dial now then he subsequently made a couple of different prototypes using different grades of loom um, and the one that we chose in the end was the one that looked pretty much stable like during like the day and then when you went to the darkness or ambient light it, it glowed very strong but mm. he also had made as a prototype this version where it was just so insanely strong that it was just glowing bright green all the time as if the watch had been affected by nuclear radiation right and that was like i couldn't stop thinking about that and then so subsequently um i asked if we could actually make that version and then he said, well, if you're going to do that for maximum contrast, do it in black ceramic. Um, so, yeah, we actually released this. Uh, and it was the first uh, black ceramic Octa Finissimo chronograph that had been, uh, been launched. And uh, and so that was that was the story behind that launch. Congratulations. It's an it's an awesome release. Thank OK, you. why don't we talk about the Baltic next? Because the Baltic is a really interesting move. And I thought it was I thought it was genius. I loved it. Well, thank you. You know, like the, the interesting thing about the Baltic is I would say it's the watch, probably of all the watches I've done that had, I've had the least to do in terms of the design process. Right. Mm. Uh, and so I remember I, you know, kind of fell in love with, with Baltic as well, just to, it was so cool that there was a brand, I guess this is, you know, uh, a brand that, that falls under the the vague heading of micro brand, right? But it just basically goes to show you that like three young, cool guys can create something from nowhere and become a successful uh, watch company, right? And so I'd watched the rise of Baltic. I was really interested in, in, in their watches. And I love the fact that they were taking amazing vintage themed designs that the, like the younger generation would like to have and putting in watches that from a price perspective were accessible enough for that generation. And it was like, Baltic mm -hmm. was one of those brands that like disproved this whole theory that the Apple watch would kill watch collecting, right? You know, mm -hmm. but if you remember when the Apple watch came out, everyone's like, well, watches, watches are over. No young person's gonna ever own a watch. But in yeah, fact, absolutely. I mean, 
it would be the equivalent of saying no young person would ever want to own a tailored jacket, which you know patently is untrue. Like, right? I mean, in fact, I would say like classic style is being perpetuated probably more than young, by young people, um, even than by the older generation. Like they they love that and they love the idea of individualism. They love the idea of craft and all of that's incorporated by everything you do with the armory, but in particular your jackets and your suiting. So same thing with Baltic. Um, and then, you know, so I started talking to Etienne and he said, yeah, it would be cool to collaborate on something. And we started talking about watch sizes. So I know like you um, have you I think you were probably been saying it longer than anyone else that the world is going to return to classic sizing. And actually the correct size for a gentleman's watch is somewhere between 36 or even if you want to go as, as small as a two for simplicity, 34 to like 38, 39. Right. Like and, and 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 the world was slow to catch up to that. It's ironic now that every they're all every brand is now trying to do that. Right. But um, imagine because Etienne took quite a while to, to design this watch. So it was uh, released last year, um, but the conversation started in sort of like 2019. Uh, uh -huh. The conversation started in 2020. Um, but but, you know, at that, and even in 2020, like not that many people had jumped onto the idea of a 36 mm chronograph. Right. Like it still felt from their perspective small. But I have to say, though, the case that he designed was just absolutely phenomenal. It's cool because, you know, he takes like elements from different eras of design. So obviously he was very, um, you know, inspired by the the vintage Longines, uh, Trey Tache cases that, you know, water resistant with a double step bezel and kind of like the, the, the screw and case back. But he just kind of came, came up with his own design language. And what was really cool in particular was the dial, because when I spoke to him, I said, it'd be really cool to do a salmon sector dial. He went through so many different versions of this, you know, initially with Arabic indexes, with, you know, brigade numerals, with, you know, whatever. And in the end, he ended up with just this hyper minimalistic like sector dial, which hmm. somehow like I just love the design of this. And, you know, I, I guess other people did as well because it became quite a popular watch. And then this wonderful contrast in different surface areas, you know, the glenet or props to finish in the center, circular brushing of the, uh, you know, the, the tachymeter and, and all the different levels that he played with on, on that dial. Of all the kind of micro brands and, and these new guys doing, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of like vintage inspired or even vintage recreation type watches out there. But I feel like Baltic is is doing new work, like the way they're yeah. handling color, the way they're handling finishes. They they are breaking new ground. So yes, they're a little bit reminiscent of a, of a vintage watch. But I'm I'm really impressed by the fact that they can like still come up with new ideas within this framework and like make beautiful new things that are not directly based on anything old you know i think that's amazing yeah i, I agree completely their, their iconography is all their own their iconography is an educated one because obviously they're they are big enough fans of vintage watches that they can you know pick out certain things that they're to be inspired by i mean it's very similar to for Lamari as well who clearly you know was inspired by the four francois bourgeois cases um, that we see in the tasty tondi and so on but have created something all of their own um and i think that that's one singular about baltic um i mean it's it's very very special I also agree with you. Like, I don't get terribly excited when I see a watch that's an exact facsimile of something from, you know, from before. But anyway, you know. Yeah, I think I think it's it bodes well, right, for watch lovers because all these this generation of new young designer, new young brand, like they're coming up with this stuff now, and imagine what they're going to be able to come up with like ten years from now. You know, it's going to be awesome. So I really look forward to that too. Absolutely. I mean, they're they are you know they're very impressive as a generation. Yeah. Um, okay, last one, Chopard. So the Chopard, you know, it kind of came about because um, like Calité Fleurier was one of these extraordinary sort of projects that in some ways never took off because it was like the the, the level they tried to achieve was so stringent, right? So basically Calité Fleurier was created in Fleurier to incorporate uh, three Fleurier based brands. It was initiated by Carl Frederick Schoifle of uh, Chopard. Um, then uh, there was also a Parmigiani Fleurier, who was also based there, was involved, as was Beauvais, which also has a manufacturer in, in near Fleurier. Um, and basically, what, you know, at the time, a cost certification was only testing a movement, right? So, what Carl Frederick wanted to do was uh, to test the entire watch. But then he went about creating a, a series of torture tests so stringent that it was really hard for watches to pass, except for the Chopin LEC watches, which were clearly constructed to take a severe amount of abuse. Um, and I have so much admiration for him. So one of the things that you see is like 
you know, I remember when I went out there, you could see like the the watches being strapped onto this crazy robotic arm, and the robotic arm would then go about creating all these kind of like insanely um, uh, uh, terrifying movements. Uh, and I, you know, and I just look at there in awe, just wondering, oh my god, that poor watch, what's happening to it? All right. Um, so as Calite Fleury uh, progressed, it was one of those things that like you know had made all those remarkable watches, but still like there was not a huge amount of awareness of it. So. And, and in addition to that, the Calite Fleury cases that Chopard made were some of the most beautiful because they have these very beautiful soldered lugs to them, you know, and, and, and mm. like most most cases today are milled, right? But the idea of having these sort of flared manta ray like rug, uh, lugs, the, the idea of having these flared lugs really mm. reminded me of that era of case making that you and I really love, especially from the 1950s when there was a lot of creativity to that. And just the addition of it being flaring out a little bit just adds so much exuberance and sort of like dynamism and uh, sexiness to a case, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I always think of it as like a little shoulder, actually, as if, if the lugs were arms, that's the shoulder of the lug. Well, you know, I would even go so far to say it's, if it was a shoulder, it would be either a Schifanelli, you know, cigarette or uh, a Neapolitan Spella and Salata, you know, like, because yeah. it's just got that little, like, touch of exuberance, like, you know, like, yeah. you know. It's got flair, um, for sure. It's got yes, a lot of flair. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. Exactly. So then um, uh, I remember, yeah, having this conversation with um, Carl Frederick and saying, you know, I would love to create a watch in collaboration with you. Um, would it be possible? And he said, yeah, you know, what, uh, what would you, what are you thinking of? And actually I had two ideas. Um, the first was uh, the recreation of the original Chopard 1860, which was launched in 1997, um, which eventually we did, which was in a white gold case and a salmon dial. And I absolutely yeah. love that watch. That one was then, beautiful. Uh, oh, thanks man. And then, and, and we actually ended up doing a flying tourbillon version of that in the same size at 36.5 mm. Yeah. Cause I did a video about that. We had a, we had one piece that you had flown over and man, I was so, so tempted. <laughs> thanks man. Oh. Well, yeah, you did a, you have to say you did the best piece of content creation that anyone did. Um, and oh, I love you. Your, your, these macro lenses was incredible. Um, yeah, because the work was so fine on it, you know, it was really like such a stunning piece of work and it was so wearable, you know, and I love the fact that they were like, everyone was willing to take a chance to make this yeah. 36 millimeter beautiful tourbillon that doesn't right. exist anymore right. in the modern market, you know. Not at all, you know, um, no. and, you know yeah, because of the era of like of the tourbillon's popularity and when it started to rise in popularity, you know, kind of coincided with the advent of large watches. Right. And so as mm -hmm. a result, there's very few like extremely wearable tourbillons. Right. I, mm -hmm. um, so so the other thing I said was, would it be possible to, to, to do a Calite Fleury watch? And he said, well, what's your idea for that? And I said, well, Calite Fleury to me is all about performance, right? So would it be possible to do a steel watch? And he said, okay, that's interesting. Then I said, you know, why don't we consider to do a sector dial, but, but to make it like a high performance watch, like let's make it a luminous sector dial. And so he liked this idea. Then we started to exchange um, different concepts. And we actually had the help of Aura Montanari because he was in, I think, Geneva at some point. And I was like, um, you know, Carl Frederick, do you mind if I invite Aura to join us for our brainstorming session? Because he is, you know, an expert on these vintage type styles. Mm. Um, uh, he was actually very enthusiastic to meet Aro. Um, he came, Aro came and he took out his iPad, his famous iPad, and he started to like just bring up like hundreds of images of, of sector dials uh, and luminous sector dials. Um, one of which is funny because it is in his steel paddock book. Um, it's on a chronograph made by paddock. Um, it was in some ways a little bit quoted by uh, Ferlan Mari recently this year when they, they really released a watch, although it's a time only watch. However, we're going to be doing a watch together with the incredible William Rohr slash uh, Messina Lab. That's ah. based on those dials, right? But the, uh, there's another dial um, which became like, you know, which, which gave the inspiration for this configuration, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because I, um, like, as I was scouring, I think through the pages of, I think a collected man, you know, you know, I love Silas and, and what he does. I later, after we or had already made this watch, found a Kari Butalainen that had almost exactly the same dial, which was really interesting. So, I mean, and we didn't know about it at all. So we had already designed this watch. And Kari, I guess maybe in collaboration with the client, maybe had brought, who had brought him this photograph of, of this vintage um, watch, it's, we ended up with, with dials that are quite similar. Um, mm. But this, this watch is very special to me because it's the watch that kind of made Calité Fleurier um, a little bit more contemporary, right? A little bit more relevant to the younger generation, a steel case, 
um, Luminous Sector Dial. And it's a watch that uh, his son, Carl Fritz, had a hand in helping out with as well, especially also the selection of this strap, which was like, you know, if you think about it from the perspective of traditional luxury, um, like not, you know, most brands would put an alligator strap on this watch. But for us, it would kind of like, it would be antithetical to the whole idea of creating a performance scientific based watch. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we launched this um, and yeah, it we uh, were many times oversubscribed um, and uh, yeah, which we made a lot more of them. Unfortunately, we didn't, but nonetheless, I'm really happy to have my piece. Uh, I try to keep a piece of, of, of every one of the watches that we did. So there's 25 of these in the world um, and I've got piece number one. I mean, I love that watch. And you know, because I saw the previous version of this without the sector dial, with the other, with the with the white dial on Carson Chan. Yes. I'm like, damn, that's so nice, you know? Yes. And so yes. when I saw you guys were going, I was like, oh my God, I'm all over that. You know, it was a it's a beautiful piece of work as well. Yes. Actually, I should I should mention that also, like I really love the version that uh, Chopar launched themselves. Um, which was a sector dial watch as well uh, in steel. And that was a watch when you looked at it, it was just, I was blown away. It was really funny because I think they also made, I think it was like 25 of those or something, something like that. Um, yeah. And I heard that like in Singapore, they had like taken deposits for like all 25 watches. <laughs> like in the first 10 minutes of like, like it being launched. Wow. And then they huh. had to go back and tell clients, like, I'm so sorry. Uh, we, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can't sell you this watch because yeah. they had overwhelming demand but uh, i mean i guess it's it's a nice thing and i love the fact that chopar uc uh, is finally um getting the recognition it so wildly deserves um based on the incredible quality of every dimension of watchmaking but especially the movements right i agree and you know i mean you know hats off to you on all the collaborations because i think it also just gives people like a new perspective on some of these brands you know like chopar is always a brand that i I liked, but I never really spent that much time thinking about until your collaboration came around. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really great, actually. So well, you know, we're, we're lucky in, in that it was something that I was thinking about. And I kind of, I, I think there's something to be said about being the first, right? Like the first one mm -hmm. to reach out to a brand and be like, hey, I really love this. Could we possibly do that? Um, mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me to of when I first went to Savile Row and I told... Uh, John Hitchcock and Anna Rowland that I wanted to create a magazine that would bring about the renaissance of tailoring and classic style. Uh, and I wanted to do a big interview on Anderson and Shepard. And they looked at me like I was out of my mind. <laughs> but they were like, yeah, sure, go ahead. We're, we're here. Because <laughs> bear in mind of that in that period, like tailoring was, you know, experiencing something of a, a you know, a hard time, but now it's you know, roared back into public consciousness, which is great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I want to ask well, you. Thanks to the rake as well, you know. Oh, uh, thanks, man. You know, but I want to ask you because you were actually the first to to collaborate with a Japanese watchmaker, Nayo Hide. Like, how did that come about? Um, you know, it's just a friendly thing. Uh, Hida-san and I were kind of two peas in a pod. I found out about him through Watches by SJX because you know I really love his his um, coverage, and sometimes you know SJX covers like stuff that's really off the beaten path. I yes. saw the photos. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool, right? Uh, There's something just about the look of it that really interested me. And so I was in Tokyo like a couple of weeks later. I had made an appointment to go see Hida-san. And man, the watch was so good. Like in the metal, it's it's like really something else. And wow. then actually like spending some time with Hida-san, that was incredible too. Because like Hida-san is, is super low key, but he's actually very passionate about watches and very experienced, like not just experience in like one brand or one aesthetic, but really like across the board, he can give you kind of like trivia and knowledge like nobody else. I mean, the only sort of people I can think of who have at their fingertips, like that sort of like quick recall would be like you or Tim Mosso. Like, oh, you know, it's, and it's, it, it's, it's because you guys have seen so much. You've seen so much, you have all your reference points and you have everything even like in between those reference points that you can just recall and be like, okay, I'm gonna do it that way, that way, that way. And this is why this, this, and this is important. Wow. So anyway, like uh, out of respect for Hida, I thought the product was super good. And I said, listen, would it be okay to sell your product at the Armory? I'd love to be like a dealer for you. And he said, yeah, sure. So we were a dealer at first. And then, um, you know, we were always constantly chatting about projects and this, that, and the other. And I said, would it be possible to make something together? And he said, yeah, yeah, of course. And so uh, me and my colleague, uh, my colleague Elliot Hammer, 
Um, we worked on some designs and we put it all together in Photoshop. We actually come up with this beautiful font called the letter cutter font. And uh, we put it together as a concept of like, well, what would it be like if you were to use the technique of you know, hand carving stone into a wash tile? You know, what, was, what would that aesthetic look like? And that's how the letter cutter came about. I think you, that has now become an inspiration for many brands, uh, Mark. Um, I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you just so, do our own uh, thing and hope for the best, you know. So tell me about, because you've got one of those watches uh, for sale in this auction, you know. Tell me about yeah. that. Please. Okay. It's, you know, this is a good question. I'm glad I can broach it with you. So the watch that's on sale is my first watch with Hida. And it's like the fifth or sixth watch he's ever made. Um, and honestly, I wore that watch more than any other watch in my life over the last, especially over the last couple of years. Like I just love, love, love that watch to death. Um, and honestly, the reason why I'm selling it is because, you know, this sale, I want people to realize that this sale is like a very deeply personal thing. Right. And it's kind of like, you got to bleed a little blood so people know like you're for real, you know? And so it's for that reason that I'm letting it go. Um, plus, you know, there are also, you know, the silver lining of it is that after it goes, then something else will come in and fill its shoes. Right. And right. Hida and I are constantly working on new stuff and hopefully uh, it just ramps up the pressure for the next thing that Hida san and I do uh, will be, it will be so good that it will be able to properly replace that first Hida that I had. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love the fact that you're, you are genuinely giving up um, some, some grails. I mean, like some of the watches that are intensely personal to you that are from any dimension would be incredibly collectible. Uh, and so I, I see the sacrifice that you're making because I, I know a little bit about your watch collecting, though I didn't realize how many long eyes and paddocks that you had. <laughs> the, dude, the longer one on the Wellendorf, bro, that's, that's sick. Well, you know, Mark, uh, again, I wish you all the best on this uh, in this initiative. And it's kicking off um, November 30th, right? And how long does it run for? November 30th till December 6th. And right. actually, we are converting the header building store uh, into like an auction preview site. So basically, you can come in all week and just like look at the watches. If you like what you see, you can place a bid immediately online. Nice. Um, I think it's the first time this has been done. So it'll be kind of yeah. cool to see like how it all pans out. Yeah. At first I was like, oh, it would have been cool to have like an in-room auction. But actually I really love the idea of like you giving people a lot of time to look at stuff, think about stuff. There's like less time pressure. And, you know, it, it's just nice to have people back in this Petter building space too. So I'm excited about that. That's awesome. No, I think that, you know, the watches are so special. I think they, they deserve to, to be um, put into the hands of potential new buyers and collectors and allow them to consider and reflect on them as well. And I think it's a great way to do it. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much, so much, so much for your time today and for all the insight. Um, best of luck with all the collaborations. Um, I'm really excited to see where Grail Watch goes next. I saw the announcement for the Frank Mueller's, which I thought were amazing. Because oh, um, obviously I had, I had one of the 36 millimeter ones and to see it in the 39, I'm like, oh, 39 is really nice. Not for me, it's a little too big, but like, I'm, I'm sure the new owners will be overjoyed about them. And honestly, like this is still... One of the best things ever. I absolutely love it. You're very kind, Mark. I really appreciate it, my friend. Not all, man. Safe travels back to Geneva, and we'll speak again soon. Wishing you all Thank the you, best. Thank you, Wei. Here. Bye. Bye.